<laughs> um, so yeah, so thank you so much for that, Eldar. And um, I would like to welcome everyone on behalf of the SFU's Morris J. Wass Center for Dialogue. And I've also been so lucky to work alongside the Democracy Exchange of X University um, and Dalhousie University and all of our incredible partners for this event, including City News, as we see here, um, who we have, where our moderator is from, Zali. And um, if you wanna take us to the next slide, Sabrina, if you may, because I won't be able to do this off the cuff, but um, we have the Tamarack Institute, Canadian Council for Youth Prosperity, UNICEF, Apathy is Boring, Future Majority, Pivot Hub, Youthful Cities Pivot Hub. You guys all have taken the time to sit with me, work out this process, figure out the best way we could have pursued this event. And I am so incredibly grateful to all of you for your time and energy and resources that you've offered me today for this event. Sabrina, if you may take us to the next slide. So we were very lucky to partner up with UNICEF on something called the U Report. Um, so Julie will be putting that in the chat really soon. So the uh, we did this specifically for this event and we asked hundreds of Canadians across Canada some questions regarding the election. So this is the first question here is, do you feel engaged as youth in the election so far? Or and do you feel like the major parties are speaking to you. As we can see here, the results are a little disappointing. And I'm going to take this moment actually to, to throw it at the audience that are with me right now. Um, so um, Sabrina, if you may please publish a poll. That's going to be up in just a moment. So if, if some of you may have watched the Federal's Leaders debate or just followed on social media, um, do you feel like they did a good job of engaging you? I'm curious to find out. Ah. So we'll see the numbers here. And, and um, as you guys are answering, I'm just going to put this on the side for a moment. And Sabrina, if you may uh, take us to the next slide. Thank you. And, and this, this one was really interesting to me. What emotion comes to mind when thinking about this election? If you look at some of these terms, some of the big ones, anxiety, confusion, stress, frustration, anger. I do see excitement, so I don't wanna, it's not all negative, there's excitement there. <laughs> but um, it's, uh, it's a lot more negative than it is positive. And this feels like this may be the consensus across the board right now. It's just a little confusing. So, and you know what, um, before I get on to the next point, let's just see where we're at with this poll. And not very surprised, but it seems here that about 68% of the audience are saying, nah, I do not feel engaged in that youth leaders debate. I am not feeling engaged right now. And um, I, I'm really excited to say that we wanna do something about that. We still have a, we still have about six days, I think, until the um, until September 20th, Election Day. And so let's use t this opportunity to really hear from all of for our youth leaders, youth leaders um, from all of the major parties. Um, and let me just share these results. Um, I'm just going to get rid of that. And if we can please go on to the next slide, Sabrina. And we um, are hosting all of these youth leaders to be here with us for a dialogue. Now you're thinking, dialogue, what's that? If you uh, just avert your eyes to the slide here. So a debate is what you saw um, last week. And a dialogue, what we're seeing, what we're going to be seeing today is assuming, is knowing actually that all people have uh, pieces to the answers of all of our future problems. We must all strive to find common understanding. The objective is to find common ground, to understand one another, test personal assumptions, and admit admitting that we can all improve our own thinking by learning from one another. And we search for the strengths and values 
in others' positions, not their weaknesses. And seek an outcome that creates a new common ground. And, and that's really the democracy that we want to see in this world, right? So if you want to go to our next slide, please, Sabrina. And so I have taken the time to meet with every single one of these incredible youth leaders. And we've, we've been very, um, you've been very strict on our rules of engagement today. So this event's gonna be youth focused, which means we don't need to use big jargon words. We can just talk because it's, it's doesn't, we don't always have to sound so smart, right? Um, be open to others' perspective. Disagreement is normal. And let's just use this opportunity to learn a little bit more about one another's um, perspectives and being disciplined in our participation. We want people to speak personally because we're all humans here. Be inquisitive. So, you know, we, we can have a really open dialogue here. It's it's not gonna just be the moderator that's asking all the questions and, and you know, no one's able to acknowledge one another unless they're cursing each other out. Nope, none of that. Imagine a dinner table conversation, okay? And, and finally, listen to understand and speak to be understood. So Sabrina, you can take the slides off. And um, I hope all of you are as excited about this as I am. So I'm going to have all of the, very slowly this will happen, but we'll have the moderators and all of our youth leaders come join us. And amazing. And Can you all see me? Yeah. Hello, everybody. Um, sorry, excuse me. My computer is totally freezing up on me. And so I'm not able to see how everyone's bios right now. But if we can put all of the bios um, in the chat. So I first want to start off with Zhao Li, who is joining us from City News. And Hi, hey. Hello. Um, and so there's uh, their bio right there. Excuse me, guys, I wish I could verbally do this, but it's just easier this way. Um, I'm gonna go by alphabetical order as I as I name everyone else. So Anthony um, Koch is joining us from the Conservative Party. Hello, Anthony. Hello. And then um, we have um, Jaden, um, I'm like alphabetical order. Jaden joining us from the NDP. Hello, Jaden. Everyone, thank you for having me. Hello, and we have Julie Astley joining us from uh, the Liberal Party. Hi, Julie. And then we have Kane um, Allen Adams, who's joining us from the Green Party. And I'm sorry, I don't think, and yes, hello, Kane. Um, well, thank you and, for having me today. Thank you. And sorry, I don't think I said your full name, Jaden De La Torre. It's a phenomenal name, so I just want to say it out loud. Um, joining us from the NDP. So hello, everyone. And I wanted to I wanted to get the opportunity to ask the first question here and, and warm up the room. And I'm gonna, you know, I'll, I'll throw it to you, Zali, because you know this is this is your space and, and you're a phenomenal moderator here with us today. But um, I wanted to ask all of you. So along with obviously the, the partisan leaders here, um, Zali as well, you know, you are a reporter in the political arena. And I'm curious. What, you know, I've had the opportunity to talk to all of you and I'm really wanting you to share with everyone what brought you here today, not just in this moment, but what brought you to be in the positions that you are in your lives right now? Why did you want to be in politics? Because, right? Um, you know, um, so I would love to hear more. And so I'll start with you, Zali. Feel free to, to start us off. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Adele, for starting us off in such a great way and for such a great warm up question for us all. Um, I got started because when I was going through journalism school, uh, politics was kind of the last thing on my mind, but then Rob Ford was mayor of Toronto. Um, so if you wanted to do any kind of story, that story was always there. When I finished journalism school, uh, I, I had an internship uh, at, at one of the newsrooms in Toronto and the boss there said, uh, look, you're good, but uh, you're not going to get a job until someone retires, gets pregnant or quits. So you might as well go somewhere else. So I took that to heart and a position opened up in Thunder Bay to cover local politics as the city hall reporter at TBT News. And I stayed there for two years. And it was really great because I always wanted to get an understanding of how politics worked 
without actually getting involved in politics, just because I wanted to keep a bit of a healthy distance uh, from that for myself. So over two years, I got to follow the council, follow a few elections. So that was really fascinating. And I got a good look at how the machine works, at least on a local level. Uh, I moved to Winnipeg for city, where I got to see how it worked a bit more on a provincial level. And then I came here to Ottawa, and now I'm covering national news during the pandemic, which is fascinating. I'm just going to leave it at it's been very fascinating. So that's uh, where I come from. I sort of come from it as a distant observer point of view, which is hard to do sometimes because, of course, I'm Canadian as well. And everything, even national decisions have a local impact, right? So, yeah. I'll let you... Um... You can do it in whatever natural order, but Anthony, go ahead. Sure. So I think uh, I probably have a lot in common with everybody else here today when it says that before politics, my first love was really history. So that's where it started for me. And then from there, you start to ask yourself a lot of questions about why things are the way they are. And very quickly, you start to realize that it's massively influenced by political decision makers. So I said, okay, well, I don't want to just be a passive observer in the way that things go about. I want to be an active participant in the society that I happen to live within. And I want to make sure that, you know, I can contribute in what I feel is a positive way. So I got involved in politics in a serious way after years of interest for the first time in the 2015 election. So Justin Trudeau's first election when he was elected. I knocked on doors for a conservative candidate in the West Island of Montreal. So for those of you who don't know, it's about the most liberal part of the country you could possibly find. So needless to say, uh, I didn't make many friends, but I definitely learned how to become a better salesman and how to put up with rejection. Um, from there, actually, I kept showing up, kept doing all the work that nobody ever really wanted to do made a little bit of a name for myself locally. And I was really privileged to have the opportunity to work on the Hill that summer for the first time in the opposition leader's office as an intern when Ronna Ambrose was at the time the interim leader. From there, I got involved with the leadership campaign that happened in 2017. I supported a uh, interesting fellow, shall we say, who has gone off the rails in the last three to four years. It was by the name of Maxime Bernier. You know, chalk that up to uh, the <laughs> foolishness of youth, I guess we'll say. Um, and from that point forward, I, I did another, I did some work in advocacy. I did uh, another stint in the opposition leader's office, this time under uh, opposition leader at the time, Mr. Andrew Scheer. Then I actually started the movement to get rid of Andrew Scheer as leader of the party following the 2019 election. And now here we are. I helped out uh, Mr. O'Toole's campaign. I was a campaign surrogate for him and an organizer in Quebec. And now I run my own public affairs consultancy. So still involved in politics more private sector side of things, have my foot in the pond, so to speak, but not as active or fully engaged, shall I say, in a professional sense as I once was. Excellent. I think we can all sympathize with the uh, Maxime Bernier anecdote. Who among us hasn't uh, thought this guy has some great ideas? Oh, no. Oh, wait. Oh, no. Um, so highly relatable. Kane, do you want to take it off next? Oh, sure thing, sure thing. Uh, so yeah, my name is Kane Allen Adams. I use he, him pronouns. And my, I guess my story uh, to do with politics is more of a life story, really. Uh, I was born uh, to two parents who were very young, very unprepared uh, to have a child. And because of that, I very quickly got to see firsthand what some social inequities look like. I got to see the impacts of housing on affordability here in Toronto. Uh, got to see what it means to have to choose between paying bills and uh, figuring out if you're going to be able to afford lunch. And for a lot of my life, a lot of those choices that I just that I just talked about, a lot of those impacts that I just talked about, really seemed normal until I took a moment to think about it. And I remember uh, I was maybe about 15 or 16 years old. I remember thinking that Canada is a one of the larger economies in the world. We're one of the richest countries in the world. And yet we still deal, we still deal with huge amounts of social inequality. About 10% of Canadians live below the poverty line. Uh, about, uh, I believe it's 1.6 million or something along that line. Uh, Canadians don't have affordable and adequate housing. And I think that that is a tra travesty. Uh, so when, uh, so I got involved with actually a liberal campaign in 2019 and then after that, I got involved uh, with Annamie Paul's uh, leadership campaign uh, in the Green Party of Canada. 
I was her director of policy and director of recruitment uh, for the duration of that leadership campaign. Afterwards, I uh, went on to be her director of remote mobilization during the by-election and really just got involved with meeting people throughout the party and realized that the Green Party of Canada is, uh, in my opinion, at least under Annamie Paul's leadership, where I want to make my political home. And I'm just very excited to be here. I'm very honored uh, to be representing the Green Party of Canada shadow cabinet as the youth co-critic uh, for the party. And yeah, yeah, I'm just very excited to be here today and having this very open and collaborative conversation. Excellent. Excellent. Thanks so much, Kane. Uh, Julie, why don't you uh, let us know how you came to uh, be where we are now? Yeah, it's a it's been a really great journey so far. I actually started off very young, being really like politically motivated. In grade 11, grade 12, I had my first social justice class and we were able to pick our electives. And we ended up coming across uh, Ms. Ambrose's actual policy itself, uh, Bill C-337, which was, it was just right after the Alberta judge had said to the victim as a witness stand, why didn't you just close your legs on the rape trial itself? And as a young woman itself, that was like a catastrophic, like this is our judicial system, this should not be the way it is. And so the bill was to actually educate federal judges on sexual assault cases. And so I campaigned the bill in my community and school and uh, my, at the time, liberal member of parliament, John Aldig for Cloverdale Langley, who's currently running right now, came to my school, came to my class and uh, was there just to like meet our students, get students engaged in politics. And we actually presented him with the bill about people's opinions that we had gathered. And a month and a half later, we had got a letter saying, you're right, like we brought this to our caucus. This is an amazing nonpartisan bill that should be passed. And they voted it into the next reading, which was getting that letter and being like, holy cow, like that was real. Like we were just campaigning as like part of our credit as like something we were passionate about, but to see it move a step forward into government was really, really gratifying. And that definitely set me on the track for both the Liberal Party and for um, politics itself. Uh, later, I went on to be the Daughters of the Vote representative for Cloverdale Langley, and I got to meet a lot of really amazing both political leaders and the leaders themselves. Um, and the more I went into university and the more I kind of engaged with the Liberal Party, the more I really loved the fact that both the MPs that I met and worked with were some of the most genuine people that I've met, especially Terry Beach, who I currently work with. Um, but also I loved their evidence-based approach for a lot of things. Um, and then I just started to get involved in model parliament. I became the SFU Young Liberals president. And from there, was, that's led me to be working on the campaign currently for um, Terry and the Liberals. Excellent. We have some very, uh, very experienced, very well-versed people here, obviously. And last but not least, of course, Jaden. Jaden, why don't you share uh, your story with us? Yeah, well, thank you so much for that question. Um, well, I'm not going to lie. I, I always like to joke that my foray into politics was kind of an accident. I just one day kind of walked into an office and then, you know, here I am because I know. So I started getting politically active when I was around 16 years old. So this was during the 2017 provincial election. And I remember um, you know, because you enter that part of high school where you need your kind of graduation hours and you need that kind of credit. So I remember, you know, kind of freaking out a little bit and going, oh, my God, like, what am I going to, I can't graduate if I don't have any hours. And so I had a friend who was volunteering uh, for the BCNDP. And then she said that, oh, we're looking for volunteers. And I said, OK, sure, you know, sign me up. So I remember walking in and just put my name in and then I went out uh, door knocking, canvassing, all the fun election stuff. And to be honest, at that time, I didn't really have, I guess, like a viewpoint about anything. It was just kind of, you know, the fun thing I did after school. And it wasn't until I went actually door knocking and talking to people, that's when I kind of realized that, you know, there's a whole world outside of my little bubble. And so it was kind of that thing where, you know, I was very shocked at first how people were just willing to tell their stories, you know, just to a regular door knocker. You know, I had to expect people to, you know, yell at me or something like that. Like, oh, I'm not voting NDP or I'm not voting liberal or whatever <laughs> the party was. But, you know, I'd had those conversations. And so, you know, for the first few times, you know, people would tell me stories about, you know, they were struggling with childcare or housing or post-secondary education and so on and so forth. And it was kind of those things where you're just like, oh, I'm really sorry to hear that. And then, you know, uh, you know, I wish you the best. And, you know, you kind of want to say something more to make them feel better, but you don't know what to say. And you can't make guarantees because you're not the candidate or you're not, you know, the incumbent and so on. But then it was kind of that thing where afterwards, you know, I heard the same story over and over again. And it wasn't just, you know, it was the one-off little family in the corner kind of thing it was a whole systemic issue and so that kind of basically opened up my eyes and going like oh like 
every decision made is a political decision and politics revolves around all of us and we can't escape it no, how, no matter how many times we say we don't like politicians or we don't want to vote and all that kind of stuff like political decisions are being made and so that kind of at first kind of made me a little bit more interested in pursuing politics because I didn't want to pursue it at first because I remember I used to say to my friends all the time that you know oh I want to be elected one day kind of thing and then they're like oh what do you want just a pension kind of thing so I, you know it, it shut me down a little bit and I go oh <laughs> like I didn't even think about the pension part of that so I was always a little bit hesitant but then afterwards it kind of went to that thing where if I wanted to make change, I couldn't just sit on the sidelines and I couldn't be like, you know, that person online who just makes their complaints or their, you know, their snappy remarks kind of thing. Like if you want to make change, you have to be proactive. And so that kind of led me to be, so it led me to get more involved within the NDP. And then I started kind of founding my own values. And, you know, I realized that I align a lot more with the NDP because I admit at first I was a little bit like, I don't know where I lean. Maybe I'll just stay with a few parties and just see where it kind of goes from there. And then eventually it led me to being the co-chair of the BC Young New Democrats and then eventually running uh, myself in 2019 in the federal election. And so kind of going from there, it basically inspired me to stay in politics to make sure that you know, we can fight to bring forward you know, these progressive changes because you can't make change from the sidelines. Excellent. I think what we see is we have four young people who are, have in common just a very deep passion for affecting change in this country and, and wanting to to be able to do well for their communities and the people around them. And one of the big issues, I'm, I'm just going to jump straight into one of our pre-agreed topics for this dialogue. One of the biggest issues that's facing all Canadians really is the relationship that Canada has with its first peoples. We're trying to walk the path of reconciliation right now, collectively, all of us. But how do you, each of you see your parties as planning to move forward with this path of reconciliation? How do you, how do you envision Canada moving towards that. I, if, if anyone would like to jump in, just feel free to unmute and just chime in. If not, I, I can just pick a name out of a hat or we can go alphabetically. Uh, let's, let's go with Anthony then, since he's right there. Perfect. Well, all right. Absolutely. And I think this is one thing that I've been glad to see again as a history nerd that has really started to come into the forefront in particular in the last few decades, but in the last decade in particular, okay? And the way that I always frame this, I always say that if you look at Canada as if it's like almost like a human being, our, our original sin to use some sort of like religious is the treatment of indigenous peoples and the way that this country was created relative to them, okay? Um, you know, you even see, and in, in, when you talk about the mythology of Canada, how it's created, you often hear this narrative. I'm from Quebec, I'm a proud Quebecer, but you often hear this narrative of the two founding peoples, which I understand, it makes sense. But there was more than two people that were two peoples that were here when this country were founded. Okay, much more than just two peoples. And that part of the narrative often doesn't get told. So one thing that I think needs to be done, first of all, which has been doing happening, but needs to happen more is there needs to be genuine society wide recognition. Not only this is the key part, because I find we do a lot of talking about the things that did happen, right, as if they happened in the past, and it's over now, these horrible we need to recognize some of the things that happened in the past, obviously, but we also need to do massive more focus on what's still happening today. And the fact that just because, let's say, some discriminatory policy, of which there are still many that are still in place, maybe something might have ended 30, 40 years ago, but understanding that there's a ripple effect that goes throughout several generations, and it doesn't just end once the policy ends, but the nature of inter intergenerational trauma, etc. Now, one thing that I can say from the conservative perspective that I've seen work very well when it comes to uh, reconciliation, particularly when it comes to providing First Nations with an opportunity to actively participate with their own agency in the broader Canadian public life and economically in particular, something that's been very successful in Northern Quebec in particular, okay? So we often tend to talk about Indigenous people as a monolith, like this happens to First Nations. It's foolish, okay? That, that's not actually, that, that's, that's the key part, is First Nations with the S at the end. It's plural. There's many different nations. And oftentimes have completely different diametrically opposed circumstances, depending on where they are in the country and the circumstances under which they happen to live. So one thing that I can say, and I find very difficult, I mean, partially as a conservative, also based on my experience, is that we often talk about natural resource development and indigenous issues as if they're diametrically opposed, okay? as if being pro-resource development is somehow anti-Indigenous or anti-First Nations people. But my experience in Quebec, for example, is the exact opposite of that. So if you go to Northern Quebec, for example, you will see that there are massive private-public partnerships 
with First Nations peoples, in particular, a lot of Cree nations in Northern Quebec, okay, where First Nations peoples actually, like certain nations in particular, will take ownership shares. So, okay, you want to build a mine here, okay, you want to build a hydroelectric dam, you want to do any of these projects, that's okay, but here are the terms and conditions. X amount of the employees that work on this project will come from nation X, Y, and Z. Ownership will be shared between whether it's the Crown Corporation and the nation or a private company and the nations in question. Gives people solid, proper jobs. It allows money to flow through the, through the communities in a sustainable way, okay? And there is dignity in work. And this is something that's important too. Yes, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt, federal government and provincial governments need to step up to provide funding to a lot of First Nations communities when they need them. But there is also something to be said about allowing people, okay, the dignity of doing it on their own, okay, and of earning their own money and contributing it to their own community and allowing First Nations people to manage their own affairs instead of Ottawa just doling out a check and putting terms and conditions in terms of how that's going to be used. So one thing that I really do believe needs to be emphasized moving forward, the recognition of the history, the recognition of the problems that still face us, but also in these big nation building projects, and I'm obviously emphasizing natural resources, but it doesn't just have to be natural resources. There needs to be a genuine partnership with First Nations people so that there's buy-in, but also so that there's meaningful participation and where First Nations people can enact their own agency and involving in this sort of thing. It's not just Ottawa knows best. Let's have a cute sit down, okay? Take the photo op, have everybody show up so that I can look like I'm doing my job as a politician and then we were gonna do, we're gonna do what we were gonna do anyway, and we're gonna say thank you. And when people criticize us for it, we're just gonna say, well, look at the picture that we took. Clearly, we did our duty to consult. So a very complex issue. Okay, we're not gonna solve this in ten years, twenty years, twenty-five years. This is gonna be a long project that's gonna last decades. You know, it maybe no won't ever be fully resolved. It's multi domain. It's economic. It's political. It's cultural. It goes into every facet of Canadian society, but. We need to start having more complicated conversations on these topics. Thanks very much for that, Anthony. I'm glad you brought up the the idea that we need to stop thinking of First Nations, Indigenous peoples as a as a monolith, just because it is a uh, it, it's a overly simplistic, naive, really way of looking at things. Kane, what did you think of what? I mean, what did you think of what Anthony just said? And what do you what do you hope the Green Party might be able to achieve in terms of moving us forward with reconciliation? Absolutely. Uh, firstly, I'd just like to thank you for, uh, for once again, thank you for having me here. And I'd also like to thank Anthony for that well thought out and expansive answer. I think uh, we all are in agreement here. I think everyone's in agreement about uh, treating Indigenous people with, with rights, treating Indigenous peoples with respect, and not as a monolith, as Anthony said before. And I personally believe that uh, the Canadian government has a lot of responsibility to take and must start taking that responsibility for its shortcomings and for systematic mistreatment and discriminations against discrimi uh, Indigenous peoples and uh, Indigenous communities. I think we need to, as Anthony said before, acknowledge the history, also acknowledge what's currently happening right now, and to move forward uh, collaboratively in a nation-to-nation -nation, uh, type of scenario. I think one of the largest things uh, that people often think when they hear of Indigenous peoples in Canada, when they hear of Indigenous issues in Canada, is uh, water boil advisories or murdered and missing Indigenous women and girls or uh, coastal gas link or all of these very large and very pertinent problems uh, that affect Indigenous peoples across the country. And for each of those points, I would say that we need to start working collaboratively. We need to continue to work collaboratively and we need to listen to Indigenous leadership that's already trying to be at the table, that's already trying to speak, that has solutions that they that they wish uh, we can start implementing. Uh, when it comes to uh, when it comes to the Green Party of Canada, uh, one of the big things that we believe in is upholding treaty rights uh, and fiduciary uh, responsibilities and respecting all Indigenous rights. That also includes land rights. So I'd look once again uh, to the Wet'suwet'en people and the coastal gas link, and I would say that uh, that there were steps overtaken over the Wet'suwet'en people over their uh, land rights in order to put in that coastal gas link. I would also look at uh, the Anishinaabek and Line 5, and I would say uh, the Anishinaabek have been very clear that they want Line 5 to be shut down, that they want uh, the 
oil to be transported not on their land. And I think the Ontario provincial government should take steps to follow behind that. Um, I think once again, um, there are many steps that we can take to listen to Indigenous peoples. We can implement uh, UNDRIP, we can implement uh, the many pieces in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission recommendations. And yeah, yeah, one last point I'd like to mention is uh, to do with water boil advisories. Uh, for those who do not know, there are 51 uh, water boil advisories that are still in place across the country. These are communities, Indigenous communities primarily, that don't have access to clean drinking water in Canada. This is the country with some of the most clean drinking water in the entire world. This is the country with the largest access to fresh water in the entire world. And yet we still have 51 water boil advisories across this entire country. In order to solve that problem it would actually cost less than it would to purchase a brand new pipeline for this country. And yet we still tend to put uh, oil extraction over indigenous rights. And I think that there is a lot of room for us to reanalyze how it is that we prioritize uh, policy in Canada to reanalyze how it is that we collaborate with Indigenous peoples and work more towards a nation to nation relationship and really just to reset our interactions to uh, to work together more collaboratively moving forward. Thank you for that, Kane. We're going to turn to Julie next for her thoughts on how the Liberal Party might help move us forward with reconciliation. Of course, Liberals have been in power these last six years and have made strides towards ending those boil water advisories as well. But Julie, tell me more a bit about how you see solutions from where you're sitting. Yeah, so from where I am, I've had a, an amazing opportunity and an ability to sit down on a lot of these conversations with Indigenous communities, with Terry as well. And we get to hear from a lot of our local Indigenous um, Musqueam and Tsleil-Waututh nations. Obviously, reconciliation is going to be an intergenerational thing. And a lot of these problems, such as boiled water advisories, is a huge, huge problem, both for the government, but also for Canada. This is a unilateral problem that it's, it's municipal, it's provincial, and a lot of it is federal. And as a small win that I know that we should be celebrating these milestones is that BC has ended all long-term water, boiled water advisories. Um, and that's something that has been taking years and years to go on. And it's nice to see these little milestones hit and to know that the progress is actually working. In terms of the Liberal Party and the way that they have tackled reconciliation so far, I've been really pleased with the bottom-up approach. A lot of it is extremely collaborative and not and I really like the point that both of my colleagues brought up about it's not monolithic. It is not one certain group because a lot of it is extremely different. What uh, Indigenous groups in the territories need is not the same as Indigenous groups in BC around here. And so, again, treating it as one big um, like check write off is just simply not possible. And what I've really liked in terms of policy for uh, both like affordable housing, childcare, rural support, boiled water advisories, is that it is structural based. It is putting in the roads, it's putting in the infrastructure, it's hiring the personnel. And a lot of that is based on you need the money to do that. And so uh, the Liberal government has actually instituted more money than any other government has ever invested into reconciliation before. And that's, to me, I'm very proud of that. And I've loved to see the progress of over 950,000 projects funded. Uh, and these are all individual local communities based on what these certain communities need. And that has been uh, really happy to see in terms of the money actually going to these individual communities. And obviously there is still a ton of work to do. And there is so much intergenerational trauma that needs to be addressed. But I think the more we continue to let indigenous voices come to the table and we continue to partner with them, both with the provinces, with the territories, as well as these individual communities, uh, the better it goes. Absolutely. Excellent. Thank you for that, Julie. And last but again, not least, Jaden, <laughs> why don't you uh, let us see how you see the future of reconciliation in Canada? Yeah, well, first of all, I just want to say I agree with what my colleagues just said, because I think fundamentally what it comes down, this isn't a partisan issue. You know, no party has a hold on this. You know, no one's morally right in order, you know, still everyone has a role to play in this. And I also want to agree to what Anthony said too about the history, because I admit, I remember when I was in high school, we never really learned this kind of stuff. And when they talk about it, it was a very brushed over, like, oh, it happened and it was sad. And that was the end of it. Like, I, it was a well, example too, right? The last, what happened last summer. 
and what we saw what happened with the um, unmarked graves you know it seeing it it's just like oh my oh my goodness like i can't believe it was that extent of that uh, inter in, sorry intergenerational trauma and so first starting off with education so people know what's going on and so we don't brush over our history and also the fact too i think we also need to have people we need to be adults about this because when that was happening we saw people deny oh you know canada is not a bad country i think we should gloss over this kind of thing oh you know it happened a long time ago oh, we, we, we've done so much more better since then that's not the point the point is that we're still facing these systemic discriminations, whether it's in housing, whether it's in infrastructure, whether it's in, you know, nation to nation relationship, there are still systemic discriminations there that we haven't corrected or faced yet. And so I do believe in that collaborative approach with the federal government and all parties, regardless of whoever it is, to work with Indigenous peoples, because we can't let this issue, you know, go on and on and on. Eventually something's going to happen where it's just going to explode and we can't have that kind of you know, approach. And I do agree also with the Green Party approach too. The NDP also believes in, in implementing UNDRA, as well as also implementing the, um, sorry, the Truth and Reconciliations Commission 94 calls to action, as well as working with Indigenous people to develop a national action plan for reconciliation, as well as ensuring that Canada's laws um, include our human rights commitment, whether it's cultural rights, land rights, and rights to self-determination and self-government, as well as also commemorating a national day for truth and reconciliation so we can acknowledge it because that's the first step of fixing this issue is we acknowledge our sins of the past so that we can better move forward so that, you know, we don't have people like what happened last time when people were denying its existence or saying that, you know, it wasn't bad, bad. And so we need this kind of approach where we work together collaboratively because at the end of the day, it's fundamentally about fixing the sins of the past so that we can have a better future moving forwards. Excellent. Thank you for that, Jaden. I think we've got a broad agreement that the denialism is a thing of yesterday and absolutely cannot happen today or in the future. But we've also got a bit of a broad agreement that whatever happens with respect to natural resources development, we need to center Indigenous experience, Indigenous opinions, and Indigenous consultation uh, when we're making those decisions, because of course, oftentimes it is their land that these pipelines are either passing through or these projects are sitting on. But I kind of want to open the discussion up to a bit more of a free flowing format. We've been a bit structured right now, but how would how would each of you how how do you see how do how do you plan involving indigenous leaders and communities in those sorts of consultations in a meaningful way? Because of course, quite often we have consultation baked in, it's required in many cases, but we often also hear that we have conflicting interests from different communities and, and, and different, I mean, when Kane brought up what so it and we have, we have different levels of indigenous authority and leadership making different claims. How would each of you want to try and reconcile these many different interests when we're trying to build that kind of consensus for, for consultation and development? Yeah, it's a big question. I know, Anthony, you're uh, you're on mute. Yeah, I was gonna say that that's a question. You deserve yeah. an award just for that one. But I mean, that like if I have if I have the genuine top of the line answer to that question, I would be in the prime minister's office right now. Um, wow, I don't know. Anybody else want to chime in? I mean, because here's the thing: you are absolutely right, and one thing that I do think needs to be addressed is a lot of the times when it comes to getting consent from a variety of nations, the question of what consent actually means in practice, is very complicated. So right, for example, in the situation in particular with the Wet'suwet'en, the elected band, band council actually approved the project. It was the unelected hereditary chiefs who had an issue with it. So then it comes into a question of, okay, well, you know, what is the legitimate form of authority or approving power in different communities because obviously you know there's people who make the argument that the elected band council was a creation of a colonial power that was imposed upon the nation it's not something that they adopted on their own volition and then there's other people who make the argument well that's that's fine and dandy but these hereditary chiefs are unelected therefore they're unaccountable and what legitimacy do they speak with so it's complicated obviously i think we all agree on that at the very basic level that it's not as simple as some people would like it to be, or that I think that we would all like it to be, just to make it you know easier for this to work. But I think, you know, I don't know. I think a lot, but that's I think what we need to sort of get through is yes, it's great. We all agree that we need you know proper consent and buy-in from Indigenous people. It's just that what does that actually look like in practice? It's easy to say that, 
but it's not the same in every place. It's not the same in terms of the structure that works in terms of approval for mm -hmm. projects in different areas. And, you know, what do we do with that? We also deal with a lot of cynicism, sort of distrust when it comes to projects like this. Ken, I, I see you're muted. Did you want to chime in here? Yeah, I just wanted to very quickly add, uh, just looping back in one of uh, the things that Anthony said earlier and all of us really agreed on, which is that lack, or sorry, that uh, that we need to be really viewing these issues. We need to be viewing Indigenous peoples and First Nations rights as a non-monolithic uh, issue, as, as something that that's really based in many varying and different experiences at different communities across the country. And I think when it comes to consultation, about uh, what consent looks like in the case of Indigenous leadership. I think that really has to happen with individual communities. I think that has to happen on a case-by-case -case basis. And I think that that has to happen over long periods of nation-to-nation -nation negotiations and uh, reevaluations. And I think that one place that we can probably start is a systemic reevaluation of how Canada interacts with Indigenous peoples in the first place. I think one of the points that is really holding us back are the laws that were written uh, not only like you know hundreds of years ago but also some that were written closer to this day as well uh, that really do treat indigenous peoples as a monolithic uh, society as one that is uh, lesser than as well and when it comes down to it I think one of the first steps we need to take is repealing the Indian Act and putting in something new to replace it I think it's working with indigenous leadership that's already at the table to implement UNDRIP and uh, work on a more nation to nation basis. The, the, the only problem with that, if you'll allow me, is like, so that's the thing about the, the Indian Act is that everybody agrees that it's horrible. Nobody has any clue what we're going to replace it with. So, it, and that's the problem, right? Is it's not, it's not enough to say something is bad. We all agree on that. It's just, hmm. what's the alternative? All, all the options mean? that have been presented have been have universally been rejected. rejected. Yeah, Julie, I, uh, you, you were ready to chime in, weren't you? Yeah, uh, same with that as well of like, obviously the Indian Act has such a blatant tie of like government mistreatment to Indigenous people and I again like that's, it's undeniable and again when we see things that replace it, a lot of it has been slowly replaced and overturned as we're like, we no longer accept this so this isn't the standard so a lot of it is becoming obsolete in terms of practice but legally it holds a lot of really um, painful policy ties but things like uh, the federal government and the liberals fully implementing unit drip uh, for the, I think it's a TRC call to actions. We've done over 80% of it. And so it's things like that, which are like slowly replacing it. But I do agree, like a universal implementation of like the policies of uh, UNDRIP as well as uh, the TRC are a really fabulous foundation, which is already being implemented. Um, and I think if we were to enact a strong legal framework with all these things, and again, as my colleagues have already said, of Indigenous voices, and again, with cynicism, like we have had such phenomenal progress. Uh, obviously, there's so much left to do, but the fact in these last six or so years, we have been able to progress significantly farther than we ever have before, um, both in terms of bringing Indigenous voices to the table, as well as lifting incredible amounts of children out of poverty who have been living in it for far too long. Um, but I also agree with everyone else that we should absolutely have stronger legal framework that's bringing together all of these small but important things that are already happening. Uh, I see Anthony and Jaden are both unmuted here. Either one of you want to jump in, go for it. I, oh, sorry. I thought I was uh, muted for a sec. It's been a long time since I've used you. But no, I just actually wanted to echo that. I, I agree with everyone what they just said because it is true. You know, these are laws that are, there's no, these laws don't have a place in modern society fundamentally at the end. And that we need to make these revisions and changes because otherwise we're following something that's been outdated for how many years. And so we need to kind of, and at the same time, too, as we follow these old rules and, or sorry, old laws, we're still perpetuating that same form of systemic discrimination. And so I do agree that we do have to make these. Uh, what does? Oh, sorry, I just read the question. What does the NDP plan to implement? Well, again, with all the other parts, implementing UNDRIP is number one. That should be the new legal framework on how we deal with our relationship with Indigenous people. We shouldn't be holding ourselves to you know old colonial laws that have you know that have been around for a very long time. We shouldn't be holding ourselves to that. We need to actually. There should be. I feel like a sort of. I'm not sure if I'm using the right term, but actually no, it's sort of like a legal convention, you know, where we get all the lawmakers along with Indigenous people to kind of chart out a new path for reconciliation as well as a new nation-to-nation -nation relationship where we sit down and we revise 
the old laws to create a new one so that we can finally have that true kind of um, nation to nation relationship. And it isn't just based on, you know, symbolic gestures or photo ops or any, like actual genuine laws that we follow and we adhere to. Absolutely agree, Jay. And I really like that idea of returning to the negotiation table, uh, really starting from the ground up, because this is such a systemic and old issue that's buried so deeply within Canadian laws. I think systemic issues like this really need systemic changes. And uh, I think one of the first actionable steps, uh, as Anthony said, the like we can say things are bad, but we're going to replace it with, I think one of the first actionable steps to go in the direction of phasing out the Indian Act and replacing it is to do exactly that, to bring people together in a cross-partisan intergovernmental task force, rapid response task force that includes, not only includes, but highlights Indigenous representation to ensure that this conversation can happen on all levels with all peoples that are involved. And I think that that would be one of the first steps involved in, in repealing the India Act. I really hate to cut this dialogue short because we are having a really good dialogue, but we have got a laundry list of topics to move through. And I don't think there's a natural way to segue into this, but of course we are facing the, the, the front end of the climate crisis right now. We've seen, we've all seen the wildfires on the West coast. We're all seeing how it affects our everyday lives. What are the most pressing actions that need to be taken with respect to climate change? How do you, how do you implement that? How do you go about that? And I, I liked this format. If, if everyone agrees, if everyone's good with it, let's keep this dinner table conversation going. Absolutely. Um, well, I guess as, as the green representative, when it comes to climate, I should be the one hopping in trying to speak first. Uh, but I think one of the large, not nuances that are missed, but one of the large things that people overlook when it comes to climate action is the idea that climate action can support, and as a matter of fact, will support our economy and will support jobs. Uh, ending subsidies to the fossil fuel sector and divesting public investment from fossil fuels doesn't mean that we are not going to be creating new jobs for energy workers and retraining uh, current fossil fuel workers to work within a green economy. Um, one of the largest economic opportunities of our lifetime in generating jobs, I think, is the climate crisis and is a green recovery to ensure that we can adequately face off against the climate crisis. I think we can all agree that one of the most learned lessons from the COVID-19 pandemic is that right now, Canada is not prepared for a large international crisis, such as the climate crisis. And learning from the pandemic, learning from the early months in which there was so much collaboration uh, between all the parties that are, that are represented here today, I think we can work together once again, in an inter, uh, or not once again, but work together in an inter-party cabinet to ensure that we have what's necessary, that all the communities have what's necessary to economically recover, to economically grow, and to shift our economy away from fossil fuel production, away from fossil fuel extraction, and towards a more green economy. Uh, another point I want to very quickly mention is that the backbone of any green economy is small business. It's your main streets, it's your mom and pop shops, it's the local butchers as opposed to, you know, your uh, your no frills and your Walmarts. And I think that it's that shift that we really need to see within Canadian society. I think a lot of people are looking for that. A lot of people are hungry to see that community centric approach. And I think that the Green Party is really trying to bring that to the table. Yeah, the, the only thing that I that I would expand upon there, because this is one thing, it's a topic that is very important, obviously, to everybody. One thing I'm happy to say here, the conservative in me, I'd prefer if this process was done using market mechanisms as opposed to having it be done by the diktat of a massive government. I'll, I'll explain to you, I'll expand on this in a little bit. But long and short of it is, it's very easy to say, don't worry, we're going to retrain people. But I'm saying you tell the 52 year old oil worker who just lost his job, don't worry about it, we're going to retrain you. You look, and by the way, Canada has some of this, but in particular, if you look to the, a great example is the United States, where you had people who were working in resource extraction for a period of time, had, were having a good life, and lost their job at some point in their late 40s, early 50s, and they've been broke ever since. And I'm not talking about, you know, broke, I'm talking dead broke, okay? 
So what I'm saying is, and this is one part of the conversation, we're young people, we're eager, we're excited, we're going to the next, but I think we also need to keep an open mind on this. It's easy to say the transition is going to be seamless. Fact of the matter is it's probably not. There's going to be a lot of pain and, and hurt for a lot of people over the course of this process. And the one thing that I will say, you are absolutely right. It is clear you see this, especially in a lot of the tech sector. The economy of the future is going to be green. The only thing that I can tell you in my experience in public affairs as a lobbyist and otherwise that a lot of these green companies are borderline cons. They take a whole lot of government money to do a whole lot of nothing, and they don't produce very much. So the only thing that I'll say, and oftentimes, by the way, I'll say, a lot of those companies are managed and operated by the people, by friends of the people who happen to be in government at that particular time, okay? So there's a little bit green business, oftentimes, you have to follow the money. What I will say, and this is the point that I'm trying to make, I do believe genuinely, and this is being shown repeatedly now, like I'm saying, this is the conservative in me, green businesses, and you even see, by the way, you know who the largest investor in renewable energy was last year? Exxon Mobil. okay? They know the shift is coming. It's obvious to the private sector dollars. You see insurance companies worldwide, they have stopped insuring a lot of these older style oil type extraction projects. They see the shift is coming and it's coming from big finance. It's coming even from, forget just government action. The private sector has recognized that the shift is happening. All that I'm saying is that as this process happens, I understand that some people would like it to happen faster than others. That we understand one, that the pain that this transition will cause to a lot of people. And two, an understanding that if we genuinely do believe in the viability of the green economy, it's going to happen and private dollars will recognize that it is superior. It's not in getting the government to start picking winners and losers and start telling people you're going to be the big green firm and this company that's actually producing the profit is going to go out of business. I know I hate to be the big bad conservative who talks about jobs <laughs> and profits. <laughs> right. relative to the green. Was, yeah. But having, <laughs> but having I, a materialist read on it is yeah. good. You need to be materialist about and, this. And I'll also say, by the way, guys, and this is the other thing too, right? We're all young people. We're all university educated. We're all probably going to have white collar jobs. That's not for everybody. Not everybody can do this sort of thing, okay? Mm. And the second part that I think needs to be emphasized as well is the hurt from the pandemic economically hasn't really kicked into full swing just yet, okay? And there's gonna be a lot of people, uh, I'm saying, so this is the thing as well, especially in the context of an economic downturn, I'm just saying, before we start saying all these jobs are no good, we need to get rid of them for the climate emergency. We need to recognize Canada's weight in the world relative to the total global emissions. We also need to understand that we're about to go into a pretty serious economic downturn, okay? We haven't felt the full effects of it yet. And we should be cautious when we start talking about throwing productive members of the economy down the drain. If I may very quickly, Anthony, uh, I think if you view uh, the environmental reforms that I'm suggesting here in a vacuum, you might come to that same conclusion uh, that we're throwing some, as you said, throwing some people down the drain. I personally would disagree because our platform isn't putting forward individual pieces in a vacuum. It's also being supported with the ideas of uh, guaranteed livable income, for example, which has been supported. And it was the parliamentary budgeting officer, I believe, who said not only could we afford it, but would it significantly assist in lowering the numbers of Canadians who are living in poverty. And I think it's these shifts these extra external areas that we're not often considering when it comes to environmental policies that we really need to be considering guaranteed livable income university sorry universal post-secondary education and uh, the wiping away of student debt fees i think these points are extremely necessary to be part of the conversation when we're talking about shifting within uh shifting towards a green economy sorry yeah i'd love to jump in um you guys have said so many amazing points. Um, and I'd like to emphasize that a lot of these are already implemented. Uh, the green economy is something that the Liberal government has been focusing on for the last five years in particular. And they have introduced the most money into green economy than we ever have before. And something that I really want to emphasize, uh, as a lot of my colleagues mentioned it about uh, fuel subsidizing and things like that, is I'm sure we all saw that the Liberal plan was both endorsed by Andrew Weaver, the leader of the uh, previous provincial Green Party, as well as um, Mark, the SFU, I believe he is a climate scientist economist.
but not only is it an incredibly well costed plan, but it is the most ambitious. It is based on not only meeting our targets, but succeeding them in a fiscally responsible time. It is recovering green jobs to a level that nowhere else in the world has seen with both our economic power and our manpower. Granted, we are on the smaller side in terms of personnel. Um, but some things that I really want to emphasize in terms of liberal policy when it comes to climate change is how incredibly systemic it is. It's uh, not just like we're going to cut emissions and that's going to be the end of it. And sorry, these jobs, sorry, this like green economy, things like that. It's giving specific subsidies to corporations, both private and crown, that there is incentive to become green. We're going to cut it on a legal way. So that way that sets the standard for everybody. But we're also going to encourage and make sure that no one is left behind because of these, um, like because of these rules. Uh, so that's like green cars. Like we're definitely cutting off emissions by I think it's 2040. Um, but that also means we're making electric vehicles uh, fully electric by 2035, which is an increased goal that we had before. And not only is it like here's the money to subsidize the vehicles and the legal framework to make sure that they are only sold in Canada. But we're also going to produce, I think it's something like 21,000 electric vehicle plug stations. So you can drive from like Fort St. John to Victoria across the country without a single drop of gas. And it's not like, oh, look, it's an ambitious goal. It is like you are set up not only to like cut emissions, but here's the vehicle that you will like mainly rely on as a Canadian citizen for these fuels. But as well, like here's the infrastructure and like $5,000 to get a um, like plug in in your home, like it is systemically helping Canadians and the economy and like the green jobs. I know we've all mentioned it before, but I'm like, that is such a crucial thing. And like, it's like, oh, the economy, like if we do climate change, then we're going to lose the economy. Like those two go hand in hand. Um, and even with Indigenous reconciliation, that is a huge, huge part of climate action and climate jobs. Uh, they have an incredible wealth of knowledge and I've loved seeing their ability to put input in. Um, and I hope it continues for both. But sorry, there's like so many good points there that I'm like, oh, I'm trying to keep track of them. But um, yeah, really great points. If I may jump in very, very quickly, I'll only be a few seconds, Julie. I just wanted to uh, elaborate on Mark Jacquard, who you mentioned earlier. He is not an environmental scientist. He's simply a uh, energy economist. Uh, so this plan was viewed and uh, viewed through the terms of it being of its costing, uh, ranked through the terms of its uh, economic energy economic uh, outlook, and it's I think it's important to acknowledge who it was and what implicit biases came to the table uh, when looking at ranking these plans. Uh, in the end of the day, uh, Jaden, you've been unmuted for a bit, and I know you're itching to jump in here. What? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah go for it anyways i just so uh, well, i'm very happy for the passionate debate on this because i think at the end we can all agree that climate we can all agree on the same thing roughly and i mean i actually do agree too about uh, what kane said earlier about kind of creating an inter-party cabinet to deal with climate change because again all the issues we talk about there is no one party dominating that particular issue you know no party has a particular sorry particular monopoly on that issue you know it's not the ndp's position or the liberal party and so on and so forth and so no, I do agree. I think with climate change, we do have the capacity to be a leader in fighting climate change. That's what excites me the most. You know, when the pandemic's over and we're able to move forward, we can implement those ideas. And one thing I personally just want to see, speaking of my own, is that we all can work together on this issue. And so, like in New Zealand, for example, right, you know, they have governments filled up with different parties. So I would like to see something similar here in Canada, where all of us work together in a cabinet dedicated to fighting climate change. So whether it's, you know, we're committing, sorry, we're we're following our commitments to the G20, the Paris Climate Agreements, um, we're reach, reaching our net zero targets, um, we're legislating it. Because I think the most important thing also too is to ensure that we legislate a lot of these climate actions. Because the thing is that we can talk about these and we can put it forward and we can do it you know, for X amount of years kind of thing. But at the end of the day, whenever the next government gets in, depending on whatever the situation is, sometimes those laws get repealed or they get replaced by something that's a little bit weaker. So one thing I'd like to see, and especially what the NDP wants to do is to, to legislate a lot of these climate actions so that we follow it through. So that no matter who's in power, regardless of the party that we're still committed to, sorry, we're still committed to hit, hitting our targets as well as putting incentives, you know, investing into the infrastructure we needed so that we can have a carbon-free economy as well as also, um, sorry, I had a point now it slipped up. I hate when that happens. It happens all the <laughs> time, that one right? Point. <laughs> But at the end of the day, just essentially working together on coll sorry, collaborating together on combating climate change, because it is 
existential crisis, and it goes beyond any political party. I agree. And I think most Canadians would be really enthused if one day we could see a cross-party cabinet to tackle Mm -hmm. major issues that are facing our country. But unfortunately, we are running short on time, so we need to move along. But this pandemic has laid bare some of the biggest problems facing our society psychologically. And, and there's been a big focus on, on mental health from each of the party's platforms this time around, which is encouraging to see. I can remember certainly, of course, 10 years ago, it was not the same. But I'd like to know from each of you what you see as the federal government's role in you know, supporting what is effectively something that is in provincial jurisdiction, health. How would you support mental health through the federal government when, of course, you know, it is a portfolio that we have devolved to the provinces. Yeah, well, I'm going to put my Quebec hat on here for a little bit, and I will (laughs) say that very much like healthcare personally, and it's also the conservative in me as well, I'm hesitant to accept the idea that Ottawa knows best, okay? So what I will say is this is obviously something that's going to be crucial. I think the role of the federal government in particular where this is concerned is making sure that the provinces have the funding that they need to run the programs that they can administer. And the the reason why I'm saying this too, with some caveats or caveats, I should say, is that I find very often in government, the accomplishment is announcing the spending. Okay. We depend, we're going to spend $5 billion on mental health, where that money goes, what it actually does. We don't know. We just know they spend $5 billion on it. In the private sector, if you spend a lot of money on something, in a couple months, a board of directors is going to call you in and they're going to say, where'd the money go and what'd you do? Like, what, what, where's the return? Where we go? Whereas in government, it tends to be, you see this all the time, the funding announcement is the purpose of the spending. It's not actually getting the program implemented in any sort of meaningful way. Now, again, just to reiterate, Quebec conservative here, I do think that the provincial jurisdiction should be respected. I think it's the job of the federal government to make sure the provincial jurisdiction, provincial uh, governments have the money they need to do the things they need to do. But again, in terms of the role of the federal government, I'm queasy a little bit about having them establish some sort of national standard where Ottawa knows best. You're not my dad. You can't tell me what to do. (laughs) Yeah, Um, those are really important points. And obviously, I am much more on the liberal side. So I'm like, the federal government should absolutely set the standard for that. Um, And I think we've done a really phenomenal job over the pandemic. We have implemented a lot of, I believe even the the sources that we put in the chat were federal resources started during COVID. Um, But things like pandemic specific hotlines, like a lot of it is based on isolation. It's mental health problems who generally people haven't had mental health problems before until the pandemic. So I really like to see the liberal policy being broke down for um, mental health services, specific for indigenous people, specific for veterans, uh, specific for federal employees, specifically for uh, like women. I'm trying to think of all of the lovely resources that I've seen. Um, Same with like bullying for high school students as well as substance abuse and opioids. Um, So I think as a federal level, they've broken it down in a way that's mental health is such a broad, broad spectrum and it does not affect people the same. Um, And it's a lot different than healthcare in terms of what the actual problems break down to because a lot of it, mental health services are connected to larger federal issues uh, such as veterans affairs or indigenous peoples Um, and things like that. I think when it comes to mental health are going to be needing to be set on a federal level at least in terms of funding or the standard. Um, But something that I really wanna highlight is the extreme, not extreme, the immense investment in mental health services for university campuses. A lot of young people struggle with mental health, obviously, and university brings together a lot of different people, both international students, as well as people from all top, like walks of life, both with uh, scholarships. Um, and I think the target for universities has been incredibly, incredibly uh, efficient, especially in terms of us being young people. We've actually got one of our first uh, questions from the chat, and I I hate to break the flow, but this is pertinent to some of the things we've just discussed. In read any kind of national standard or or, or, uh, for for healthcare or for mental healthcare, wouldn't such a thing be negotiated with the provinces before it was actually implemented? Would that not sort of negate some of those concerns Mm -hmm. about federal feet stomping on a provincial yard? Yeah, thank you for for bringing that question to our attention, Charlie. And honestly, I'm starting to feel a little bit like a like a broken record because I keep saying the same thing over and over again about <laughs> collaboration, interparty collaboration, but also intergovernmental collaboration. I think uh, any uh, national standard needs to be set through an intergovernment 
uh, Intergovernmental Rapid Response Task Force. And I really want to highlight that word rapid because we're currently in the midst of seeing uh, a secondary pandemic with mental health. One in five Canadians uh, experience mental health issues every single year. Canada has the third highest youth suicide rate in the industrialized world. That is extraordinarily wo woesome. That, that makes me feel very uncomfortable. And uh, just to put it down into like dollar sign numbers, the economic cost of not acting on mental health issues across the country is over $50 billion per year. Uh, so I think in every single way that we view this from a humanistic lens, from a health lens, from an economic lens, necessary federal action needs to take place because it's quite obvious that what's happening right now, this patchwork of systems is not working and we need systemic and, and real change. The only thing uh, is- I think uh, one of, if I may, if I may very quickly, and I'll, and I'll like cede the floor to you immediately after, I think one of the big steps the federal government can take is putting in a lot of uh, the process for the decriminalization of illicit drugs uh, and the implementation of a national safe supply. I think that's a step that the federal government should take immediately and then intergovernmental rapid response task force stuff happens afterwards. Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, the, the only thing that I'll say as well, I didn't necessarily want to get personal on this, but I guess I'm going to. Um, I see a psychologist very regularly, okay? And it was something that took me many years to actually properly do because uh, I suffer from depression. A, and that's the main overarching thing that I've faced for many, many, many years. And um, one of the problems that I had for a very long time, and some of these, I guess, are, are kind of male specific, but I think it's important to hear that too. And I'll give you an example. I remember just a quick little story. Um, Stephen Harper was in town. He was launching his book in Montreal. A Montreal senator asked me to come staff him for that day. I'm standing in the suite of a hotel where my grandmother, my yeah, yeah, who's an immigrant to this country, worked as a line cook for 25 years. And my little schmuck self is sitting there, okay, shaking hands with the prime minister in a suit I have no business wearing in the situation. And I was miserable. So like in one sense, I'm sitting there going, I'm so grateful for this country. I'm so appreciative of the opportunities that I have. And then I'm going, but why am I not happy? My life is great. My family is awesome. I, you know, I've got all this opportunity ahead of me. I'm very privileged in a number of ways. I don't have, you know, when you think of the acceptable problems that you're allowed to have, I didn't have any. Of them. And yet I was still miserable. And I was trying to figure out like, what the heck is there something fundamentally wrong with me? What do I got to do? And that once I finally got to that point, the amount of time that it actually took me to properly contact a psychologist and was way too long. Okay. And I'm lucky. Thank God I didn't try anything. Okay. But what I'm saying is that first step, even once you recognize the fact that, okay, there's a problem. I should probably check this out. I had no idea what I was doing. I was firing blank into the dark. And this is the thing, you know, we can talk about statistics and what the federal government should do. The thing is based on my experience, this is very much a local thing. Okay, and this is very much something that needs to be done, even at the city level, even like I, like I like the fact that, that we're giving money to universities, and all this, but it's just, it's so personal. And I'm saying for me, I'm thinking about my situation and all that it took for me to finally get involved and get the help that I so desperately need and that I still benefit from to this day. And I'm not particularly convinced or I don't necessarily, I can't see the connection myself right away, how some brand new, you know, government program type big thing the only thing that I can see that could happen in a direct way that the amount of money that it costs me to see my psychologist is often absolutely absurd and prohibitive. And I understand that there is most people would not like, you know, there's some times where I need to see my psychologist fairly regularly. And there's no way that if I didn't have the means that I have, that I would have been able to afford that. So I think the most important, and I, you know, I'm lucky. I never got to the super dangerous, scary thing. Nobody wants to get to but sometimes I ask myself that, you know, if I didn't have the resources that I had, could have I? Maybe I did. And then I'm, I immediately think to the people who was in my exact same situation, the only difference between me and him, that he didn't have the same access to financial means that I did. And then I think that it's very unfair that that person would have to go through my experience and potentially end up in a far worse situation than I was able to. So I definitely think if there's ways to subsidize the cost or to increase the, the supply of the services so that the cost can go down, Absolutely. But on the whole, man, I've got to tell you, federal politician putting some policy in place, I'm not convinced would have made that much of a difference when it comes to 
me seeking out the care that I so desperately needed. So I don't have the solution. It's just, I find sometimes when we have these conversations, we talk about it from the perspective of statistics. And all, but I want to add a little bit of a personal touch to it just so that I understand. And uh, again, my situation is my situation. My experience is my experience. I'm sure there's other people who have similarities. I'm sure other people don't, but that's just my take on the situation. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely, you Anthony, and thank you so much for uh, sharing your personal experiences today. I know that that's oftentimes a very difficult thing to do, especially a very courageous thing to do uh, in private, but even more so in public. So just thank you for that. Uh, I would like to just very quickly say that one thing the federal government can do to change the amount of money that has to be paid out of pocket, as well as to lower waiting times, I think, is to renegotiate the Canada Health Accord to prioritize the expansion of mental health and rehabilitational services. And I think that that is most definitely one of the first steps uh, that a green government would do if ever elected. I mean, probably not going to happen ever, but uh, one of the things we must definitely advocate for with each and every one of our MPs. Anyways, sorry about cutting you off there, Julie. Go ahead. Oh, all good. Uh, Jaden, do you want to pop in too? Yeah, no, I just wanted to say that it's, it's in the New Democrat in me to talk about healthcare because, you know, we, the party of healthcare. Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to use that line. But, um, you know, I am excited about the expansion of including, sorry, the expansion of healthcare and include these services because, you know, we are the only country in the world that doesn't include this kind of coverage under our current healthcare system. And so, you know, including, and not just only on mental health, but also including things like pharma care as well and dental and eye care and all that stuff. So we can have a universal head to toe kind of coverage so that people can access the resources they need for help. Like for example, the BC government recently just launched the wellbeing website. So it's for people who need help accessing mental health services, whether it's, you know, um, resources or tips for, um, sorry, resources or tips or just any service that they can get. And so I think, I don't believe personally that, you know, it isn't like the federal government's coming in with a kind of hammer and, you know, we're stamping out people and saying, this is, you know, our job, you know, you listen to what I say kind of thing. It's again, it's a rather collaborative approach. I mean, we did this in the 1960s with the liberal minority government of Lester Pearson and Tommy Douglas, along with John Diefenbaker. So I think that again, you know, there is no, you know, one partisan stamp on this, that like we can work collaboratively in doing this. And, you know, we did it in the past with universal healthcare. I think we can do it this time around too, with all parties working to expand that kind of head to toe coverage so that everyone has access to the supports they need. Because fundamentally at the end of the day, you know, people just, people need to be supported regardless of whatever it is. And no matter whatever their background is or monetary means and so on and so forth. It's just, we need to have those services available. And especially the pandemic did prove that when, you know, when the first, in the first months of the pandemic, right, everyone thought that it was just going to be a couple months and then we'd go back to living our lives normally. And then it dragged on and on and on and on and on. And we saw the increases of how it negatively impacted our mental health. And there were no services or not that there were no services, but there wasn't kind of a way for people's concerns to be heard at that time. So with now with what's going on, you know, we do need to take that kind of lens where we include kind of a mental health a viewpoint in legislating all of this so that people can access those services and so that people can have that kind of support that they need so that, you know, hopefully this never happens again, but if in, you know, let's say in the distant future, some, something like this happens again, we're ready and we're prepared. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, and even like what you guys have already mentioned in terms of uh, federal, subsidi federal subsidization for the provinces, because each province will have their own uh, niche mental health services and mm -hmm. concerns, and they don't need to be, again, addressed monolithically. Um, but things like national commitments to funding these uh, provinces, I believe it's uh, through budget 2021, it was $50 million for mental health specific to the provinces. And in 2017, we were already working towards a unilateral support for mental health services. And I believe it started at $2.5 billion uh, by throughout 2025 and 2026 leading up to it. Um, so these things are already in place and obviously there's a lot more to do but again like a federal subsidization is a great way to go for the provinces because not all provinces have the same um they don't have the same economy and they don't have the same resources yeah. and there's no need for provinces to have to struggle and find that themselves and the citizens should have to be left out just because the federal government wasn't able to have a mass allocation um, and it was allocated based on which provinces needed it the most, which was uh, something that I really appreciated. And we're seeing the effects of it, thankfully. All right. And I see Adele's hopped back in here, which is our signal that we are very close to end of time, which is depressing. This could have gone on forever and it would have been actually really interesting. But that's the politics nerd in me. Right. So hi, Adele. Hello, uh, Sabrina. 
here I am spotlighted. Look at that. Um, holy, holy, holy. You guys are incredible. Just truly, um, you've really shown partisan leadership in a way that I think the real federal leaders could use really a tip in your guys's um, handbook. Because truly, guys, it was just an honor to hear all of your perspectives and have honesty and transparency and, and, and seeing places where there can be consensus. Ultimately, I, we've all had the conversation um, one on one, but democracy is really all about consensus, collaborative um, action. And to see it, see a little mini version of it here with our youth leaders has been a really special opportunity. Um, I, I am so sad to be this person to, to close the show a little bit, but um, all good things have to come to an end. And um, I, I think seeing the messages coming in from the chat, it really shows how imperative it is for, um, for opportunities like this to happen more often. I'm seeing agreed, fantastic, look at this. You guys are just, I mean, thank you. You just, you, you blew us all away. Um, Zhao Li, oh, you were just a phenomenal moderator. Thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me, it was an honor. Oh, Anthony, thank you. Um, Jaden, thank, thank you. you. Julie, thank you. Kane, thank you. Just thank you and to my support staff, Sabrina, Claire, um, Democracy Exchange. Uh, Dollhouse University, there's just so many. Just thank you to all who've had the time one-on-one -on -one with me and, and to make this event happen. And to the youth, to the attendees here, this was for you. This was an opportunity for all of you to see what your peers are capable of, what your parties are capable of. And it's so important for you to engage, vote. September 20th is um, 9 to 9 p.m. Anywhere you are, you can vote. Um, and whether that be for any of these parties, it, 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 there's no right answer here. All of us are just figuring out the best way to proceed. And the important thing is, is we engage. Um, I'm going to pull a stat that I got from Future Majority um, that it seems that 40% of our um, electoral demographics is, is youth. So if all youth really were to come to the polls, we would have a heck of a lot of power. And not only do we have that responsibility, but we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our ancestors, and we owe it to our future generation to show up. Thank you guys. And um, look at that, I think we're just right on time. Ooh. We're gonna close the show. And if you can close us off, Sabrina, with some music so it feels Good. Thank you so much, Adele, for hosting. And thank you so much for City News for coming as well. And for panelists, you guys did so good. You guys are all so impressive. Holy cow. <laughs> you guys too. This was great. We got a good flow right there. Yeah, seriously. Look at that. As well. uh, I said so in the chat, but I'll say it out loud here. Like if, um, if any of you ever want to continue to have a conversation like this, please feel free to reach out um, and yeah, yeah, I'd love to continue to have these kind of collaborative conversations because this is this is what we need if we're going to fix uh, the the issues that we're currently presented with the climate crisis, the pandemic, the recovery, all of that. We need collaboration. We need new voices, and uh, and I love what I saw here today from everyone else as well. So yeah, let's yeah do we, it. we we need to talk about it, not just parrot lines at each other. Talk and listen yeah. and hear each other, right? Yeah. Just want to say thanks again for having me here and really enjoyed having the conversations with everyone i mean i'm not gonna lie i mean this is the last election right you see the kind of vitriol on twitter and social media and everyone's you know it's either my way or the highway kind of thing and you know i think i'm pretty sure some of us are guilty of engaging in that from time <laughs> from time to time but other than that i'm actually really glad we had the chance to all meet and discuss important issues because at the end of the day again no party has monopolies on these issues this is fundamentally how we're going to fix it moving forward and i'm glad i got the chance to meet all of you and thank you for listening to my opinions i'm just happy someone wants to listen to me speak <laughs> absolutely and um anthony i see you saying how um yeah thank you guys so much and you know what turn up the music sabrina i could use some vibes right now it's like the end of a movie <laughs> anthony, uh, the <laughs>
I just want to very quickly say that to you, Anthony, and anyone else who's also celebrating on high holidays over the past uh, week, and we'll be celebrating them soon. Uh, Thank Samantha, you, and, uh, and have a great one, yeah. Thank you so much.